Morning guys, welcome back to Max Talk. What I'm going to discuss today is the issues of um, magazine changes while standing in a static position and also the dropping of magazines on the ground. Uh, I find this kind of amusing. I've got this, this comment here that I found on YouTube. It wasn't at one of my videos. In fact, it was at, I, I was looking for that uh, video I referenced in one of my previous talks about the, the cool guy uh, who's actually a very legitimate guy uh, but uh, he said he had the secret, the secret of the GWAT, and that was ready up drills. And it's kind of interesting. So uh, I got this comment, so let me read this, this comment here, and I think this, this is very relevant. He says, uh, thanks for being the new generation. I am from the Vietnam era of training. Based on the past experiences, I notice a lot has changed. From the way the rifle is held to the tactics used, fire and maneuver. And he talks about a bit of stuff. I retired two years before 9-11. So please understand, what I'm about to ask is from genuine curiosity that I don't comprehend. These two things drive me nuts. Firstly, he says, why is it that for the last 15 years I see people train to stand up in their current position and do a magazine change as fast as they can? Believe me, I have been shot at. <laughs> and the first thing I do <laughs> is try to find cover or at least concealment to do a magazine change. I have always trained this way. Also, everyone now just dumps their magazine on the ground before they bound up to the next position. If you are doing an assault on a position that is 300 yards away, you would not have a single magazine remaining to reload he means reload the magazines with rounds. Once you consolidate and redistribute the ammunition once the objective is taken. Please anyone from this new era explain this to me. We often were far away from a supply truck to replenish the seven magazines each man carried in the company. That is 700 magazines. Please I really am trying hard to understand these two things. Okay guys that is excellent. So we've got a bit of an issue going on here. In many ways, a lot of the individual manual of arms for the rifle, for the AR-15, etc., it is so much better than it was before, and we're doing a lot of things a lot better. And of course, we incorporate all this. I, I, I don't want people to think that Max Velocity Tactical is some kind of old school crazy. Uh, I think the beauty of what we're doing at Max Velocity Tactical is that we're incorporating all the advances, but we're not forgetting the old stuff the old stuff that was relevant. So although we've made a lot of changes, um, you know, and, and, and things have improved, and things have improved through the GWAT in many areas, in particular combat shooting, weapon handling, equipment, gear, that kind of thing. But there is a, a big issue here, and that is a lot of these guys, these cool guys, are going to be coming out of these units, and they're going to specialize, and that even includes things like the Ranger Regiment, which I know so in the Ranger Regiment, but which you know are nowadays nicknamed Baby Delta. Something like the Ranger Regiment should be the absolute repository, crucible of all things small unit tactics. Unfortunately, what's been happening over the last, uh, and this is not specifically to criticize the Ranger Regiment, but what's been happening is you get you know the premier hostage rescue unit, and you get things like the Ranger Regiment who have been focusing on direct action, close quarter battle, etc. And so I have mentioned a couple of units there, and obviously we, you know, this applies in many cases across the board. So although we've learned a lot of things in the GWAT, it's absolutely true that small unit tactics, small unit light infantry tactics, has massively suffered. And you don't seem to see many, I'm not saying it never happens, many instances where actual small unit tactics, or the art of, is actually carried out. So rather than some guy on a YouTube video telling you that he has the secret of the GWAT and people never understood it before the GWAT because they weren't doing, you know, the ready up draws correctly and now, etc., 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 what would be more useful would be to have an acknowledgement that, yes, we've got better at something, but that some things have gone by the wayside. That's why you really... Some of these guys who come from certain areas have trained in a specific thing and become very useful at that specialized thing. This is not supposed to be a rant about that.
but you've got to be careful where you're getting the information from and what you want is information that comes across a broad spectrum of experience across different combat operations, different training, different missions, this kind of thing. So this is what we're looking for. It's important not to forget and then we won't get questions like we get from this Vietnam guy who has a lot of relevant things to say. So let's talk about that for a minute. Firstly, the standing changing magazines in the shooting position. This is something that's absolutely key. So if you're initially learning, that's fine. But we don't teach you that way at Max Velocity Tactical. What we do, we have a specific combat reload drill. So let's just specify what we're talking about here. So a combat reload, sometimes known as a speed reload, is where you've shot the magazine dry, you're in contact with the enemy. That's a key factor right there. And you need to get the old magazine off the weapon and you need to get a fresh magazine on the weapon. A tactical reload and continue firing. A tactical reload is where you have a partial magazine and you're taking that partial magazine off and retaining it and then replacing it on there with a full magazine as quickly as possible so you've got rounds on, on the gun all the time as, as far as possible. So we don't train uh, combat reloads where you would just stand there. And this is a big issue. We always improve our position of cover. And we even have drills where we're going to simulate that by going from standing to kneeling and kneeling to prone. So yes, in a general situation, what we want to do is if we ever have a stoppage on the weapon, whether that be a combat reload or some form of malfunction, we want to improve our position of cover. It's absolutely imperative because people are shooting at you. And if you don't, then, you know, that could be catastrophic. There may be situations in which you um, will do the, the reload in a standing position, but it's important that we put that into the proper context. If we're just doing that on the range, if instructors are teaching it just to do it stood there on the range, then what you are doing is not getting a proper understanding of the context of why you should do this, and this may be contributing to a situation where you may become a casualty because you just didn't know any better. So a little bit back there to sort of the misapplication of close quarter battle training where you may be training something which is happening inside a, you know, a structure, but you're not understanding that it's not properly applied outside of a structure. However, yes, during, during the actual conduct of small unit tactics outside of a structure, there are specific circumstances where we will actually um, do, perform a combat reload standing, but specifically not standing in a static position. So the kind of situations that you might actually perform a combat reload are when you are, as mentioned, on a, uh, an assault line moving forwards through an enemy position, then you will perform a combat reload um, on the move. You don't want to stop, mess around. You want rounds back on the weapon as, as soon as possible whilst keeping on line with the rest of your team. You may also do it as you're bounding forwards as part of fire, fire movement if it's appropriate, as long as that doesn't keep you up for too long before you get back down into cover. So it's up to you whether you're going to do that quickly as you bound forwards, as you rush forwards, or whether you feel like you've got to sprint and then get into cover and change magazines. Alternatively, and something that we don't usually let you do in training at a basic level, is that you may uh, perform combat reloads on the move while conducting a break contact drill, so that you actually perform the reload as you're moving from position to position, and then as you get back down into position, you're, you are at that time ready to fire. Uh, you've got to realize that, that it, it's easier for us to, to, to train it on an assault through where we're keeping our weapons pointed down range as we do it, but on a break contact drill, we've got specific safety procedures where we've got the weapon down in the patrol ready position as we move because we don't want the weapons waving around in all directions as people perform combat reloads, for example, in a peel drill. So there are some safety things that come in that, you know, at a more advanced level, you may, you may be able to conduct this. But I'm just making the point that there are times when you're going to be up and moving where you're going to perform a combat reload. You don't necessarily have to do it in cover all the time. Again, it depends on the specific situation and, and what's appropriate. If we look at the uh, actual close quarter battle thing for a minute, well, I always find this kind of interesting when you see guys who um, are teaching this kind of the static standing changing magazines. And some of that comes from a CQB environment. And then you also get situations where 
people are teaching transitions and the transition is being transitioned from rifle to handgun and that transition is specifically taught for a close quarter battle environment inside a structure but it's taught just in a standing position. How can you have like an operator ready t readiness test where you're just in a standing position if that's applicable to a close quarter battle TTP and it would not be appropriate outside of a structure. Outside of a structure, whether an individual as a team, if we've got some range from the enemy, then we're going to go to cover or even on the move and change magazines on our primary weapon system, which is our rifle. We're not going to go to handgun unless it's an emergency situation at close range. Now, inside a structure, why, in my experience, why, why are we teaching to stand there and transition? It's only going to become necessary if it's just you. If you're conducting, for example, close quarter battle drills in a team, then what you should more appropriately do is get out of the way, clearing your sector of fire for your backup, whoever's alternate sector of fire that is, get out of the way and take a knee. It doesn't preclude you from drawing your handgun, but you do it as you go to a knee to get out of the way so that hopefully one of your buddies can take out the threat that you were unable to take out because you had that weapon stoppage or malfunction or you know, whatever it was that you had that meant that you couldn't make the shots that you needed to make. Um, alternatives to that abound. I mean, I talked about that in the tactical manual. I mean, if you if it's just you or it's in some very close quarter environment, two things are going to happen in a very close quarter environment. You're going to have to go for your handgun or it's going to be that close. It's going to be muzzle thump. It's going to be hands on anyway. So again, there's nuances. But to train a transition drill or reload drills just standing there isn't in itself appropriate to a CQB environment. So quite frankly, I'm not sure what these people are actually teaching this for. You, you're going to have to do something, whether it's improve your position of cover, or get out of the way, whatever it is, you're going to have to do something as part of your combat reload drill. I didn't really mean to get into close quarter battle stuff here, but you've got to ask yourself, what is the, uh, the reasoning and the rationale and the why behind some of these drills that you see on the cool guy ranges. So yeah, big issue. Why, why are we just standing there and, and changing magazines? We, we need to be doing something about it. We either need to be moving as part of a drill, as in assaulting through going forwards, as in uh, bounding back, breaking contact, or whatever we're doing. I mean, also, you know, you can do it whilst you're bounding forwards. You could change a magazine also. Um, but if... Other than that, you should be taking cover. You should be improving your position of cover in order to deal with any kind of stoppage in the weapon. So let's look at the uh, the second part of that question, which was the the idea of, of dropping empty magazines on the ground. And to a certain extent, Max Fossey Tactical is guilty of this, but we do it for a reason, and I will explain that reason why. It's always important to get the reason why uh, and also apply in context. So what do we mean by this? So on a combat reload, sometimes known as a speed reload, you've shot the magazine dry. The assumption is that you are in contact with the enemy and therefore it's important. It's not a malfunction, but just in the same way that if you do get a malfunction, it's important that you get the weapon back in the fight because you're in an active engagement, in an active contact with the enemy. So having shot the magazine dry, you're simply going to drop the old magazine, the empty off, and then as quickly as possible, place a fresh magazine on the weapon and then continue firing. That's the rationale. Um, a tactical reload, on the other hand, is where you have a partial magazine, you're not directly in contact, and you're going to, as quickly as possible, switch out the, the partial magazine with a, a fresh full magazine, and you're going to retain the partial and the rounds that are in it. In the sort of Back in the day, as it were, you would probably have done a magazine, a combat reload with retention, by which we mean magazine retention. So you would have, as part of that combat reload, you would have taken the empty magazine off physically in your hand, and then you would have put it away in a magazine pouch. With the advent of dump pouches, that's become faster and more convenient. Back in the day, you probably had to sort of fiddle it away into an actual sort of, you know, non-user friendly, old school sort of Alice magazine pouch. And that's all going to slow you down before you get the fresh magazine on. So the rationale is to get the gun back in the fight as quickly as possible. Now, where this has application is if you don't have time 
like you're on an assault, like you're on, like I mentioned before, if you're conducting an assault through, you're online moving through the enemy position, you don't have time at that point to, um, to fumble, even with dump pouches, you want a magazine on the gun so you can move forward with the line sweeping through the enemy position. Similarly, on a break contact drill where you're trying to get out alive, and of course it's by no means guaranteed that you will, you don't want to waste time, you want to maximize fire at the enemy. And therefore, on a break contact drill, you know, you will litter the ground with your magazines because those magazines are not worth your life. And that's the rationale behind this. Now, sometimes in training, it's tempting to actually be a little lazy and cut corners. If you think about this, if you're conducting assault drills, you're generally going down the range and therefore you're going to finish the drill at the end of the range and you're going to walk back and you can pick up your magazines. But if you're conducting break contact drills, then you're going to patrol all the way down to the end of the range where you're going to get the contact and then you're going to have to fight all the way back up the range and what that's going to mean is you have to go back down afterwards to pick up all those empties that are laying on the ground. And What we don't want to do in training is train that laziness in so let's, for example, say, hey, we're going, to do, we're going to do all our magazine reloads with retention so we don't have to go back down the range and pick them up after. And that's laziness. So what you're doing, therefore, is you're trading your life for the fact that you retain the magazine. So you have to go back afterwards and pick up the, the empty magazines. Now, what I tell people here is that we, if you get an opportunity to retain that magazine, Get the weapon back in the fight by dropping it on the ground, the, mag the empty on the ground. But then, if you get an opportunity to retain that magazine, depending on the circumstances, then do so. There's lots of sort of higher tactical applications of this where you may actually ultimately retain the magazine. You might be in a support by fire position, at the end of which you've got a little sort of collection of magazines right next on the ground next to your weapon, which you're going to pick up before you move on to the next task. Similarly, in an ambush, you might dump, dump, dump mags, but before you withdraw from the ambush site, you're going to pick them up. You want to leave them on site. So you can play the, the modern combat reload with the idea of keeping those empty magazines. It just depends on the circumstances. Sometimes what I see is guys being lazy and they'll try and retain the magazine. They, they might be conducting a break contact drill and then they've sort of picked the empty magazine up off the ground in order not to have to go back down the range afterwards and they're kind of carrying it in their in their support hand sort of they're holding the end of the rifle and this empty magazine and it's ridiculous and a side to that is if you're going to have a dump pouch make sure you can get the magazines in it one of the issues with dump pouches is that if you if you don't sort of stop at a certain point and redistribute then you end up with sort of a mix of empty magazines uh, partials from tactical reloads and they're all sort of banging around off your ass as you move around. So at some point, if, you, if you've got a dump pouch which is getting full of stuff, you're going to have to stop and, and, and redistribute that. So I hope that kind of talks about the rationale of why we are going to drop an empty on the ground to get the weapon back in this fight as quickly as possible. And then we're going to, if, if we have a, a realistic, you know, ability to retain or pick up that empty, then we will do before we move on. This kind of goes on to the guy's final point, which is, which is, um, actually reloading fresh rounds into empty magazines that you've used. And obviously, you know, he used the example of conducting an assault over 300 yards and then getting there and you've dropped all your magazines on the ground. And not only do you have any no, no magazines anymore, but you've got no magazines in order to uh, replenish from any bandoliers that you're carrying. So there's a few aspects to this. In a way, it's kind of typical military because everyone's only issued with seven magazines and they're all accounted for. And how dare you lose them? And this is kind of, you know, I mentioned before about on a break contact drill, how sometimes the things that we do in training impact what we do um, in combat. And for example, and I, I, can't, I can't vouch for what I say here, but my understanding was that when, when the old sort of the, the aluminum mags came out for the, for the AR-15 M4 or M16 platform back in the day or whatever exactly it was, uh, my understanding is that the, the intention was that they would, the magazines would come pre-loaded so that when you got an ammunition 
uh, redistribution, it would just be become in magazines. And of course, those magazines would be expendable. And of course, you know, I don't know how true that is. Um, people can probably correct me. But um, obviously that didn't happen in the way sort of the military operates. And, you know, you get your seven magazines or whatever it is, and you've got to replenish it from bandoliers. So a couple of aspects on that. If you have a choice, then you should carry you know, more magazines on you. And if you have, uh, and without getting ridiculous, and I've talked before about a resupply logistic chain, ammunition forwards, casualties backwards. And so when, when the ammunition, either you know, additional ammunition that you might carry in an assault pack or whatever ammunition comes forwards, it would be great if that was already preloaded in magazines. If it's not going to be and all you've got is seven magazines to conduct this assault, then you're going to have to retain your empty magazines. What you're then going to have to do is at a time when you, you've got an opportunity on the consolidation phase, is you're going to have to replenish those magazines, probably from bandoliers. And therefore, if you're going to carry um, bandoliers, it needs to be proper bandoliers with the rounds and stripper clips, and you need an effective, um, I forget the name of it right now, I think it's, I have a very good, it's not the old spoon, but I have a very good um, magazine loading device which just bangs those rounds in there. And it allows for sort of, you know, three pushes and you've got a 30 round magazine loaded again. So you're going to have to think seriously about how you're going to reload those magazines with, with ammunition once you get a moment and how you're going to carry that spare ammunition. I hope that sort of covered the general points. The general points were why would we conduct reload drills? from a static standing position. Why would we dump our empty magazines on the ground as part of those reload drills? And, you know, having lost those, those magazines, what are we gonna do when we've got no magazines left? Um, it's very important to, to not get caught up in the tactical stuff and to think about the correct application of, of how how you're going to be conducting operations. You know, if you're if you're taking everything from, for example, you know, hostage rescue missions, specific direct action raids, that isn't necessarily going to help you if you're training and planning on conducting small unit tactics, wherever that might be, general small unit tactics out in the woods. Uh, so we need to we, what we need to do is we have a broad a broad understanding of small unit tactics. We shouldn't be just getting our information and our TTPs from specific roles. We need to not forget the holistic nature of, of, of the art of SUT. One of the big issues I see in general in the military is the loss of small unit tactics as a skill. Probably because we've been doing things in a specific way over the last years of the GWAT. And at some point, that's going to come and bite us in the ass because we're going to be fighting some other kind of conflict where you're not going to necessarily have the support that you want uh, or that you're used to. You're going to have to, you're not going to be conducting very quick direct action raids, hitting three three compounds a night, etc. cetera. You're, you're going to be doing infantry work. Um, and whatever context that is, context that is, whether that's infantry work purely in the military or in unconventional warfare. And when you're doing that, you need to have a broad understanding of this, of what light infantry small unit tactics is. And it's important not to take the fads or the gimmicks and understand the reason why we do things so that we can do them the right way. Guys, I hope that that was useful to you. Um, I'll try my best to, to answer uh, comments, etc. As usual, primarily I'm active on the Max Velocity Tactical Forum, uh, which is where we get most of the discussion on these topics. I do try and also answer the YouTube comments, etc. Um, please uh, subscribe, like, and share, and get the word out about these video videos. This is this is real tactical talk. It's all about building the whole warrior, the warrior mindset, and it's about perspective and nuance and getting these things right. Thanks very much.